Jen and Cam are two funny ladies who like to talk about murder, mass murder, murder suicide, serial killers, spree killers, thrill killers, contract killings, honor killings, and a whole lot of other shit. Too heinous for me to list here. If you're disturbed by this sort of content, you may want to listen to something else. And if you're a child trying to listen to our true crime podcast, well, you better ask your mama. <laughs> Hi, Jen. Hey, Cam. How are you? I'm good. I'm sitting here and it's icing outside. Ooh. Oh, yay. That's awesome. Ooh. It was so pretty yesterday at 50 degrees. And now today it was like it's... open the windows pretty. I know. I know. It was gorgeous. Shocking. What you got for us? Speaking of shocking. See, uh-huh. I always like to segue no matter yeah. what we're talking uh-huh. about. Uh-huh. Trying to get sure it back here. Uh-huh. Makes no sense. But I have a case for you today. All right. You ready? Yeah. Hit me. Let's here go. we go. So we are headed to Warwick, Rhode Island. Now it's January 27th, 1987, and a 27-year-old single mother by the name of Rebecca Spencer is sound asleep on her couch. She wakes to a stranger above her. The man has a knife and uses all his strength to bring the knife down and stab Becky violently, repeatedly. The killer stabbed Becky a total of 58 times, leaving her two young children without a mother. Thankfully, the children were staying with their grandparents and they were not home at the time. Becky, you just can't even make this up. Becky was scheduled to move from her home like the next day. She was moving out. There was boxes all around, but sadly, she would never be making that move. It sounds like somebody was mad at her is what it sounds like. This quiet neighborhood is left in shock with a murderer on the loose. Police believe that the intruder broke into the home planning to burglarize it, and then was shocked to find somebody at home. Police are also sure that they're going to solve the crime right away. But instead, the case went cold and years pass. Two, to be exact. It's September 4th, 1989, when mother and grandmother Marie Bouchard, along with her daughter Mary Lou, went to check on her daughter and Mary Lou's sister, 39-year-old Joan Heaton. And Joan had two two babies, Jennifer, Mm -hmm. age 10, and Melissa, age eight. Now, the family, the mom and the sister, thought it was weird that uh, they hadn't heard from Joan over the weekend. And it's a long weekend. It's Labor Day here in the States, if you know what that is. Um, So we usually get an extra day off, which is on Monday. And it's unusual that Joan would not talk to her mother or sister, especially on a holiday weekend. As Marie and Mary Lou approached the house, they knock and rang the doorbell and found it odd that Joan would not answer the door. After all, her car was in the driveway. After not getting an answer, they let themselves into the home. The minute they opened the door, the smell hit them. Once inside, they saw blood everywhere. First, they came upon Joan, who was in the hallway, sheets drenched in blood covering her. Joan had been stabbed several times. Nearby was Jennifer, also covered in blood and stabbed. Finally, they find Melissa on the kitchen floor, dead from stab wounds. All three have been violently murdered several days earlier. The crime scene was particularly graphic. They called the police and emergency workers arrived just minutes later. Police worked hard to block and secure the scene. One of the first clues found was empty Band-Aid wrappers on the floor in the bathroom. Now, this indicated, or so they believed, that the perpetrator must have injured himself Mm -hmm. during the course of the attack. Located nearby were washcloths and towels drenched in blood, along with a size 13 bloody shoe print. It's always the shoe prints. The crime scene spoke to officers. It was clear that this was a rage-filled attack with overkill. Joan's body, along with the girls, had been covered up with a blanket and sheets, indicating that they believed the killer was ashamed. The Mm -hmm. killer was ashamed of what he had done. He didn't want to look at what he had just done. Sign of remorse, yep. Exactly. I learned anything from forensics files. That's what I learned. That's all that you learned, too, I'm sure. Mm -hmm, Pretty much. This also meant that he spent some time in the home. It wasn't quick. He, you know, he didn't just break in. He had time to, by indications of the bloody towels, either clean it up and or, you know, place blankets on top of the bodies. So they knew he had spent some time in there. Two palm prints were found on the table. 
And judging by the size of them, these prints belong to the killer rather than, you know, the little girls or Joan. Famous Dr. Henry Lee came in to look at the blood spatter to determine the height of the killer and the position of the killer during the crime, among some other vital elements. I always think that's so interesting, Mm -hmm. the science of that. But is that that true science now? Haven't they kind of debunked it? Well, I know they have the bite marks, but I think, no, not necessarily. Because I think depending on where the blood is and how much, you know, if you're really tall, obviously there's going to be less blood. I mean, bigger blood on the ceiling. If you're really short, there would be more marks, I believe. Right. But some of the stuff that has claimed, I think some of it has been debunked. I don't think it's as precise science as they've actually thought. To okay. believe. I'm just I'm not the, for sure. I'm spitting just spitting the facts here, Jen. I'm just I know. you know, I'm giving just, you what I got. I'm just saying that's what I think I heard. There you go. Dr. Lee mm-hmm. also was the one that indicated that the shoe print was a size thirteen. So a pretty pretty big person did all this. An autopsy would be performed and it would reveal a few key things. Joan Heaton, this is unbelievable, had been stabbed fifty seven times. Jennifer had been stabbed over 60 times. In fact, the handle was missing from the instrument, the knife that was used. She also had broken ribs. The killer crushed little Melissa's skull with a nearby stool from the house, from the room, Mm -hmm. and stabbed the girl nearly 30 times. The knife actually broke off in her neck. I mean, that's rage. That's pure rage. Pure rage. Knowing that the area had a ruthless killer in the community, the, they, the authorities, contact the FBI and ask for a profile to be created as to what kind of person could commit such a grisly crime. The FBI created the profile and indicated that the perpetrator would be male between the ages of 15 and 25. Since the victims were white, they believed the killer would be the same. The area where the Heatons lived was a middle-class working area, and so they believed that the person that did this would be a local. Most frightening was that the FBI said this person would kill again and again until they were caught. At the police station, investigators were working the case when they discovered there was a connection between Heaton's crime scene and Becky Spencer's crime scene. At each scene, a palm print was lifted, and they wondered if maybe, just maybe, the prints would match. They gave the prints to an analyst, and bam, they were a match. The same killer killed both Becky and Joan and her family. That was two years apart. Same area, though. What authorities now know is that Warwick had a serial killer in their midst who needed to be stopped before he could strike again. But what they did not yet know was that this killer would be the youngest modern United States serial killer. Mm. Desperate to find the person responsible for the gruesome murders, FBI profiler Greg McCrary, you know him, right? Mm-hmm. Greg McCrary was brought in to consult on the case. McCrary told investigators that he believed the killer was not only local, but probably from the neighborhood, as in a close neighbor. How scary oh. is that? Uh, very. He also believed that the killer had done a similar crime earlier. And obviously, we, we kind of know that with the um, palm print that they found. He believed the person intended to break in and steal from them, but then ended up killing them instead. McCreary also pointed to the overkill in the case due to the number of stab wounds. He also believed that the killer hurt himself in a frenzy stabbing himself. And that's what they, I mean, pretty much. Originally thought, right. They knew that. You find Band-Aids in the bathroom. So was anything taken from the house? I mean, if it started off as. Nope. Okay. Nope. All right. Nope. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Okay. The press would name, because you know the press likes to do this, would name the killer the Warwick Slasher, as the community was petrified they could be next. It would take just two weeks and a police officer with some eagle eyes to see someone with an injury on his hand as he was walking on the street. Oh, wow. That is eagle eyes. They were in the car. The gentleman was on the street. According to Denise Lang's book, A Call for Justice, Police detectives Ray Pendergast and Mark Brandreth were patrolling a park near the Buttonwoods area. Now, that's the area, the the neighborhood. You know how neighborhoods have little Mm -hmm. names sometimes? So that's the area of Warwick. That little area was called Buttonwoods. And this was on September 5th, 1989, when one of the detectives saw a person he knew. Detective Pendergast once coached a youth basketball team with this young man on it. Now, would that be weird? That would be shocking. 
So the officers, you know, they ask him to come over and they want to talk to him. And, uh, you know, they ask him, hey, what are you doing? You know, he's just hanging out with some friends. Okay. And then he, the officer says, hey, have you heard about the heat murders? And um, the young man said yes. And he had even watched as authorities took the family's bodies out of the house, indicating he's a neighbor. Mm-hmm. As he was talking to the detectives, they see his bandaged hand and they inquire how he got the energy. How he got the energy, Jen. As he was talking to detectives, they notice his bandaged hand and they inquire how he got the injury. Okay, now this makes more sense at first when you thought they just saw him walking down the street and saw the man with an injured hand and they're like, hey. No, okay, now I got it. Yeah, Yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. Ramp it all around. (laughs) Circle the wagons. I got you. Now I see that they were just talking to this guy Mm -hmm. and they noticed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought that he he was really eagle-eyed. I thought he was really, you know, like the bionic man looking from a distance. Yeah, okay. They're good. They're good. Not quite that good. Anyway, as the young man was talking to detectives, they noticed his bandaged hand and they inquire how he got the injury. He stammered to come up with an answer, but finally said that he'd put his hand through a window of a car that he was breaking into. Oh, okay. Interesting that he would admit that crime. I was trying to steal a car. Yeah. I was trying to steal a car. I guess car theft is better than murder. I I guess, but still odd. The young man was a 15-year-old by the 15? name of Craig Price. 15 years old. The detectives at this point felt uneasy about his story. They didn't quite believe him. But for now, they let him go. So they go back to the station. And, you know, his story about the broken window, it was really bugging them. It was really gnawing at them. So they decided to do a little bit more, you know, digging around to see if they could prove that story fake. And uh, so they travel out to the area where Craig lived near the Heaton home. And he did. He lived right by the Heatons. And they uh, went to the location that he claimed he tried to break into the car. And the idea was they wanted to look around the street, see if there was any broken glass. They could not find any broken glass. None. There was none in the street. Again, that they're starting to get very uneasy about this. But again, that, you know, it, it could be nothing or it could be something. But they needed more evidence. And you got to say here, there is something about the gut instinct for the officers. Mm-hmm. You know, you kind of have that feeling because the one coached him in a basketball league and all that stuff. At this point, detectives reach out to friends and they hear a few interesting details, such as Craig had been bragging about killing Becky Spencer. Now, oh. mind you, that was two years earlier. So that when he was 13 years 13 old. 13 years Lord. old. This little fact is all they needed to get a search warrant for Craig Price's home. A team was developed to carry out the plan. Detectives Arthur Anderson, Kevin Collins, and Tim Colgan decided to stake out the house prior to the search. They actually wanted to make sure the entire family was home. They wanted them all there so that when they got in there, nobody would be out and about. You know, it's more safe that way. Plus, I think they're going to be able to find out more stuff. So it's in the very early morning hours on September 17th that detectives rang the doorbell of the Price home. The door opened and Craig's dad stood there in shock as he saw a group of investigators standing there ready to go through the home. Could you imagine mm-hmm. you, I, you, what's going on? The rest of the family who were asleep were then brought downstairs to all sit on the couch and, and stay put. They wanted They wanted them all seated, secured, as the officers were going to basically turn the house upside down. Now, it's interesting to note at this point, the whole family was visibly upset, all except for Craig, who kept falling asleep. You have all these officers going through your house. I think the last thing you do is fall asleep. And I don't care how old you are, maybe if you're under three, but just an odd thing to do. The search would reveal exactly what they needed. In the shed behind the home, a bag was located that had several knives covered in blood, bloodied clothing, bloody sock, among other things, that made the detectives know they had the right guy, that this young man was, in fact, a killer. Craig Price was arrested and taken into custody for the Heaton murders at this point, by the way. So Craig Chandler Price was born on October 11th, 1973 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, to John and Shirley Price. Craig would be joining his older sister and older brother, making him the third child born from the union. John and Shirley were devout Baptists, with many in the family being ordained ministers. As a kid, Craig was a funny one with a flair for making people laugh. 
1978, the family moved to the Button Woods neighborhood in Warwick to raise their family with good schools and friendly neighbors. Craig was a bright child at Warwick Veterans Memorial High School, but didn't really try, or honestly, he didn't even care about school, so much so that he was held back in the seventh grade. It just wasn't for him. Perhaps part of this was the fact, as he got older, he discovered drugs, as so often happens with kids. One night when he came home on LSD, his mother loaded him into the car and drove him to his grandparents' home, where they started quoting Bible scripture at him. Well, like, basically yelling. And I don't mean to laugh, but I just, I can, I can appreciate as a parent, you don't, <laughs> what are you we don't yell do? any, yeah, yeah. And your kid's on LSD. Well, let's and, go. Yeah. So he, obviously, they thought that this would solve the problem. It mm-hmm. did not. No. Craig began going to parties and breaking into cars. And this, of course, does not set well with his parents. And so he was caught and sent to juvenile court where he was placed on probation. Craig, at just 15 years old and close to 240 pounds at the height of 5'10". Now, this is, you know, the sophomore, He's a big freshman boy. sophomore. Yeah, big boy. Mm-hmm. Was brought into the station for more questions. Detectives wondered how difficult the confession would be to obtain, but it was not difficult at all. And guess what? They got way more than they even expected. When you told said how big he is, I could mm-hmm. only imagine the panic Becky thought waking mm-hmm. up to that or, big or Joe well, he was and the actually girls. right. Mm-hmm. No, just a big kid. As Craig sat in the interview room with the officers, it didn't take very long for him to admit that he was, in fact, the one responsible for the Heaton family murders. Now, he gave a detailed account of what happened, and we're going to get to that. But he surprised detectives again at this point. When sitting in the chair, he asked about Rebecca Spencer, the young woman that was killed just two years earlier. And this kind of threw detectives off. I mean, they kind of had that suspicion, with, but for him to at 15 years old, just readily ask about her. Right. And at this point, he admitted that, uh, yeah, he also killed her. He's just Uh. 13 years old at that time. So here's how he goes into all this. Craig had no difficulty remembering his first murder. He provided investigators with details of the night in question while showing little remorse for what he had done. After his confession, a wave of disgust mixed with relief passed over the detectives. Four murders solved in a space of just a few hours. I mean, that's unheard of. Investigators working on the case at this point, I mean, obviously they're really happy. And they're hoping that, you know, justice is going to be served for these brutal crimes. And they, you know, obviously everybody's hoping that this young man at 15 years old is going to get a pretty hefty little prison sentence um, and be rehabilitated possibly, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But guess what? That is not the case. Craig Price would tell officers exactly what happened that night. On that September evening, just two weeks prior from being caught, Craig Price was high on LSD and weed. He approached the Heaton home and he made two small cuts in the window screen. It was just enough to slide his fingers inside and push the screen up. He then climbed inside the Heaton home. When he got into the kitchen, he paused for a bit, wondering if this is really what he was going to do was he going to do this? I'm sure he's questioning himself. And then he had mentioned this to an interview that I credit in the sources that he thought to himself, you know what? I really should just let the little girls survive. Oh, but he doesn't No. That thought of survival or having them survive would change as one of the little girls reached out to touch him. It's dark in the house. He would act swiftly and take her to the ground, stabbing her. It was his first victim of the night and the one that would be his downfall, but our win, as he would end up stabbing himself, leaving evidence behind. As Craig told a room full of detectives the story, his father, who was sitting next to him, had to leave the room to vomit. The knives were located in the shed behind his house. Police also found a sock, bloody and large, that matched Craig's size 13 shoe. He had lost a sock. That's why he didn't steal anything, Jen. He's on foot because he's a kid. That was why I said we'll get to that. Right. You can't really carry out a big screen TV when you're climbing fences and running. That's true. Or if your hands, you know. And you're barefoot. Cut really rough. Yeah. Craig would say. could, but he's on acid, too. Yeah. Craig would say after he saw what he did, he covered the Heaton's bodies with blankets. He said he started to clean up the scene, but he got scared that if he stayed too long, police would come and he would be caught. He then gathered the knife, bloody towels, and gloves and put them in a bag and he left for home. 
This is the bag that they would find, um, you know, in the back of the shed. Craig would tell officers at first he just wanted to burglarize the home. But once he got in the home, by the window, he climbed onto the table inside. Yeah, there was a table underneath the window, if you can picture that. And he climbed onto the table. Well, he's a big fella. And so he caused it to collapse. And this is where he left his handprint. On one of the TV shows I watched about this, which I thought was interesting, seasoned police officers have to know this stuff, but it's incredible to see. So he, with the collapsed table, the officer's like, hey, I have an idea. Everybody turn out the lights. So they turn out the lights and he takes uh, like a flashlight and he bends down at eye level. And you know how you can see a print sometimes, like you can, it's naked to the eye, but you can see like the, and that's, that's how he found the print, which I thought was pretty interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Craig would claim that as he made his way through the house, the noise must have caused Joan to wake up and check out what was going on. Craig said that when she turned on the light, she was shocked. Craig then attacked Joan by beating her and strangling her as she was fighting for her life. So this would cause the other little girl to wake up. Now she gets up and she tries to make a run to the phone to call police. But Craig stopped her. Again, taking some knives from the kitchen, he started furiously stabbing her in a violent rage. <sighs> Craig would tell officers he didn't realize that the family would fight so hard for their lives. When the youngest was still fighting, Craig took a chair and knocked her on the head. Like he literally like fractured her skull. She's eight. Mind Baby. You. Tiny baby. So after telling officers all about the heat and murders and giving them details, obviously, he would only know. This is at the point that he asked about Rebecca Spencer. They have a confirmation. They know that he did this. And so he, the story about Becky, he goes into that. But Becky Spencer, her children, Stephen and Danielle, and her brother Carl had lived in that house that they were in that night that he broke in there. And they had rented it for about a year. The lease was up and they had to move. So almost all the furniture in the house was boxed up. Becky was exhausted, getting ready to move. She had people over that helped her that night, but they had since all went home for the evening. Becky was excited to move and start her future. She planned to attend college, and she was excited for what was to come. Mm -hmm. That night, you know, her children were gone, and she would eat dinner with her and her friends that came to help, along with her brother who swung by before going to work. And then at around 9 p.m., another friend came by to help pack up, and he would tell police that that night he saw a group of kids playing outside. And one of those kids was Craig Price. It was nearly midnight when Becky's visitors all left. She put on her nightgown and she was ready to go to sleep. She fell asleep watching TV. Craig Price snuck in the house and looked for a weapon to kill the one sleeping. Oh, he At grabbed 13. A, That's, he's 13. I know. I can't. He grabbed a kitchen frying pan, but realized it was too heavy and too hard to control. He then saw a 10-inch carving knife. This would be the weapon that he would use to stab Becky 58 times. Panic struck as Craig had realized what he did, and he ran from the home to the fence. So he's making his way home. He tried to climb it, but he realized he still had the knife in his hand. So he tossed the knife in a nearby bush and made his way home. Now, once Craig made it home, a shocking realization hit him. He had touched that skillet in the kitchen. He left his prints there. He knew it. At this point, he raced back to the home, made it back inside, grabbed the pan, and then ran again. On his way home, just like the knife, he tossed the pan into a bush. At home, he was worried someone would be awake, but they were not. He was covered in blood and needed to get his clothes off. He undressed and put them in a trash bag, which he hid in the attic. He then went to the bathroom to clean himself up. He went to his bedroom, where he got high, and went to sleep. Now remember, Craig Price was just 13, 13. years old. That's insane. I it is. I can't. Dr. Spencer DeVault was the first doctor after the crime to evaluate Craig. And this was just months after the Heaton murders. Craig Price had just turned 16. I believe when he killed the Heaton family, he was three months shy of turning 16. The doctor would describe him as articulate. He said Craig did not seem anxious or angry, and he was very cooperative. 
He said that Craig did, however, show a lack of empathy for others, and he had difficulty controlling his impulses. And most notably, he had an underlying deep anger. Well, yeah, can tell that. Yeah. Now, what I can only say is not fair, I guess, is the best way to say it. Due to Craig's age at the time that he committed these crimes, you know, he was 15 weeks, mere weeks, months away from turning 16. And since he did admit to the violent crimes, you ready? Mm -hmm. He would never stand trial for these atrocities. According to the laws in Rhode Island at the time, all the state could do was hold him in training school until he was his 21st birthday. And training school, of course, I had to look that up because normally we call that, you know, juvenile detention. It's kind of the same thing. But a training school is a mandatory educational program within a juvenile correctional facility. I think it's a little bit more strict than a juvenile detention. After serving this time till his 21st birthday, Jen, he would be released. And his record would wow. be wiped clean. He would not have a record. It would be clean. After so all, four brutal murders. Mm -hmm. All he had to do is serve five years in here. Wow. Well, needless to say, this does not go over well with the community in mm -hmm. which he lived and terrorized, might I add. But you have to remember, there are not also a lot of serial killers under the age of 18. This was, you know, this is an anomaly. This doesn't happen all the time. I mean, honestly, you're usually in your 20s sometimes later, sometimes earlier. But on September 21st, 1989, Craig did have to appear in court for a hearing that would place him in the training school. Craig did stand and he did plead guilty to the murder and burglary charges. Craig Price was sentenced to the five years that he was supposed to do Rhode Island Training School's Youth Correctional Center, a maximum security detention facility. Here's where Craig's pretty smart, let me tell you. As part of his sentence, he was supposed to go to an intense psychological examination and therapy. But guess what? Craig refused, and he evoked his Fifth Amendment rights uh, when asked about the murders. Now, here's the thing. Why would he not want to go and give a psych exam? And this all brought up something to me. Here's the thing. If Craig did comply, there's a chance that the doctors might find that he is mentally unfit, and they would place him in a psych hospital or psych facility. And this is different than serving your sentence in a correctional facility. Now, this all harks back to one of my favorite best movies and books of all time. If you remember, Randall McMurphy chose the mental institution over the prison sentence, but he didn't realize that time in a psych hospital is different than a prison sentence. Prison has a hard release date. You're going to be out on February 15th after you've done your 15 years and you're out. That's it. Whereas the hospital staff, they're the ones that decide when you're done. They decide when you get to go home. Craig Price knew this, and he didn't want to give them away any of the illness that he had in his head because he knew that he would most likely be doing a much longer stint than the five years. Hmm. You with me? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I am, actually. So while in training school, Craig made the best of it and got his GED, or high school equivalency test, and began taking college courses. Now, by all accounts, he was a good inmate. All of this leads to more trust, of course, which leads to him getting more freedoms. When the community found out about this, due to an article written in a local newspaper, they revolted and demanded that all these freedoms be removed. And they were, which of course is going to make Craig Price upset. The bigger issue facing all of them at this point was Craig Price's upcoming release date, specifically how to stop it. In a great article written by Rachel Bell entitled Craig Price, Confessions of a Teenage Serial Killer, she details uh, a lot of stuff that goes on with uh, what is happening to prevent Craig from hitting the streets again, I guess is the best way to say that. Several people would play key roles in this venture to keep him locked up, namely Joan's mother and sister, along with Detective Kevin Collins, who was on the case, Assistant Attorney General Jeffrey Pine. Now, a bill was proposed named the O'Neill Bill, which would require harder sentences on teen murderers. In 1990, Collins and Pine were instrumental in getting it passed. So that's good. In 1993, Attorney General Pine would introduce a bill that would give permission to commit a mentally ill person to a mental institution if the person posed a danger to society. So that seems pretty okay right? I mean, thinking about that. However, there's some backlash. 
Advocates believe that the bill would protect people who could be in danger, while the opponents believe that the bill would discriminate against the mentally ill and, in particular, was aimed at Craig Price, which, in reality, it was. The Craig Price bill was passed that same year, and the hope was renewed that Craig would have to submit to those psychiatric tests. While all this was taking place, Craig, he's just living his best life in there. He's getting ready to exit the facility. He's not thinking about all, how all this is going to affect him. He's close to turning, turning 21, which means he's going to get out. Um, and he did all of this getting his way. He never had to submit to a psych diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Now, all of this is, uh, you know, hitting the news and let's say some big ears, literally, <laughs> were listening. In May 1994, President Bill Clinton flew to Providence for business, but was greeted with thousands of people picketing the upcoming release of Craig Price. President Clinton would give a television interview regarding the Price case. Clinton would say that juvenile records should not ever be sealed, especially if they're that violent uh, history, and that juveniles with this history should never be allowed to buy guns. He also said that he didn't think Craig should be let out so soon. So, of course, this is bringing lots of publicity to this case. Oh, exactly. The cause. Things take a turn for Craig Price, and it's not, it's not good. While serving out his final months, it seems that Craig threatened to attack an officer by the name of Mark Petrella, who worked at the training school. This little incident, and when I say threat, let me, let me just back that up. It's more like, I'm going to kill you and don't go home. So you better watch it when you <laughs> leave tonight. So it was a little bit more than a threat, but I digress. This little incident was deemed simple assault and extortion, and now Craig was no longer a teen, see, because he's not mm-hmm. a teenager anymore. Right. So this is a whole other set, uh, set of charges, different trial, different, different courts, rules. everything. Mm-hmm. So he was arraigned for this, and he was set to attend trial in the fall of 1994. Well, also, you know, all this time he, he had gotten his way, and he did not ever have to do those psych exams, but it's about to catch up to him. Because at his age now, failing to do so would make him in contempt of court, or so that's what they declared. He still would not comply. He, he's not, I mean, at this point, he should have because he's already in trouble, but it's his choice. Craig would still not comply. So the judge found him in contempt and added another year to a sentence to be carried out at the adult correctional institution in Cranston, Rhode Island. Now, finally, while Craig did comply with the mental exam, he lied. He was not the most <laughs> truthful. So again, oh. he's gonna, he's gonna, that's going to come back to get him too. His assault trial against uh, Mark Petrella began on October 3rd, 1994. The courtroom was packed and panicked. Now, they all know at this point, it's not so much about the extortion and the threat on this officer's person, right? Mm-hmm. But it's about if they don't find him guilty, he's most likely going to be out in a year now, right? So he'll be 22 record his juvenile record it will it will seem like he never even committed the murder so there's a lot at stake here the first witness to take the stand was mark petrella himself who testified how craig verbally attacked him and threatened to kill him if he returned to work other witnesses would testify to the event as they had witnessed it that day and you know basically backing up petrella the following day craig's attorney asked for an acquittal he wanted an acquittal because he didn't think they had enough evidence well of course the judge was like "Mm, deny not happening. <laughs> so what you know how you can always have that choice to take the stand, but there's you know there's those tactics that you know like our good friend, our good friend Bob Mata, you know who's mm-hmm. an attorney would claim there are tactics to get what you want um, from the person on stand. That's why a lot of times they advise that the person that's on trial does not take the stand. Correct. Well, Craig did not. He did not heed that advice. So he takes the stand and he testifies that. Even though he did have cigarettes and lighters, and that was found on him by Petrella, that he claimed that he never would turn on him. He never hit him. He never insulted him. He never did any of that. He was, you know, he was just doing his thing. And like I said, lawyers know what they're doing sometimes. During his cross-examination, his true colors showed. Craig became irate. He was livid on the stand. And he said that everybody just wants him to get in trouble and that they're all liars. And uh, yeah, obviously, it was pretty intense. That doesn't look too good for Craig. On October 6th, 1994, the case went to the jury and it would take them only a day to decide. Craig was found guilty on both charges of extortion and simple assault. In December, the judge sentenced him 
to 15 years, eight of which were to be suspended at the Adult Correctional Institution in Cranston. Okay, so you know, he got so some has more. serves eight, seven more years, right? Give or take. Well, yeah. and that other one, so eight. But guess what, Jen? Mm-mm. Mm-mm. It's not going to be the final sentence for Craig Price. Oh, okay. And this next little thing, I found two different things, so I'm just going to say them both because it, they're both not good. But Craig got in a little fight with a corrections officer, and he either bit him, bit, you know, chomp, chop, or yeah. he stabbed him in a fight in February 1996. Well, those are two complete different things. And uh, like I said, their sources. D- depending on, okay. And, and throughout this, their sources of everything. And, and so if I made a mistake, just know I went with one and not the other because there okay. was some. He right. apparent That happens quite often. Yeah. Right. So I just wanted to say Craig would be found guilty and he was sentenced to an additional year in prison for this fight with the officer. The following year, Craig once again stood trial for criminal contempt for lying during those psych eval exams. Remember, he lied. He did finally do them. And so then they brought that all back around to him. You lied under oath during that. So now Craig would plead guilty and he was given, you ready? Mm -hmm. Another 25 years. Oh, now that's better. That's a better. Uh Uh-huh. So again, in October 1998, Craig assaulted yet another correctional officer and won another seven more. And then he was sentenced to four more years for verbally and physically assaulting another correctional officer. He is locked up right now. It, it's, it remains to be seen will he win or if he will ever get out. Um, I didn't even get, go down this long rabbit hole, but he said that he has become, quote, the official state demon, end quote. Oh. Craig blames racism and the legal system for wanting to keep him in prison. And he made a quote, and I didn't write it down here, but it was something like that, um, you know, if you're a black man in Rhode Island, you, you, all the white people see are demons with horns. Something, something to that. To that. Um, and I do want to point out here that uh, his victims, which is unusual because we know that killers usually stick to their own race, and ve- he did not. So, uh, and he's a black young man, right? And young mm-hmm. being the key word. So he is uh, sitting in jail, not very happy. The town's happy. I mean, this was really, um, I mean, I just, I, I, I get sentencing. It could be a harsh sentence for somebody that's so young, but to be released at 21 after you, this wasn't just a crime of passion. I mean, he killed somebody at 13 and then did the same thing two years later. For no reason. For no reason. I mean, yeah, and, the, and he really hasn't said that. Not that there he, is a reason to kill anybody. But he just went into the house for the purpose of, mm-hmm. correct? Like, the, mm-hmm. he and wasn't the, mad at them or he wasn't. No. Well, and there, there's all these, because it look, it's almost like he likes to tell lies. So one of the reasons he said earlier that, um, and I didn't, I didn't even include this because t- this could go on and on. There's articles and books. And I mean, this was, it's just, it's a psychological study into the young man and what went wrong, basically. But he said that he went to kill Spencer because he and his friends were playing a game out in the yard outside and Spencer's brother or boyfriend drove past him and yelled a slur at him and that just fired him up and he was so angry. So he went to go kill that guy, but that guy was not there and he ended up killing Becky Spencer. But then when they talked to those people, they said that that was false, that that never happened, that he, they never yelled a slur reading between all of the lines and there's lots of lines here. It just seems like he is an angry, angry young man that, you know, or he's kind of psychotic. Well, like you said, it, when he was a young man, he had like a friendly looking face. He was a right. cute kid, you know, and he, he could have, he was a big guy. He could have totally been a star athlete. He could have been a star football player. Who knows? But instead he found drugs and then just kept going down the not good path but all of none of that leads to murder that's what's so confusing right. you know robbery things like that or maybe even assault but not murder so that is the case of craig price which if you go look up the united states youngest serial killer his name pops up right so and um you know i know i did uh what is his name can't even think of it right now there was another one that was really young too and he the same way but he, he basically and then he agreed that he would kill again and so right. he's, you know, he's in his 40s now, I think mid to late 40s, sitting in prison. Where he belongs. I mean, it's... I concur. Just some people are broken. We've talked about that. Right. Well, and, uh, and even the guy he spoke with said that he didn't... What was the word that you used when they were talking about his personality? He didn't... Oh, he had no empathy and no empathy. underlying rage. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
interesting. That is um, it just, that's one of those brains that I would like to see what's in there and how that works because there really is, you know, and he, by all, he came from a good family, a good devout right. Baptist religious family. So what, and what makes somebody father, go can wrong? Can you imagine sitting there when you hear all the details of what your son did? No. You brutally. And he, he said it matter of Just fact, like with matter, the, the Moscow mm-hmm. murders with, uh, or any killers well, I'm gonna put, family. I'm going to put in the um, show notes too, there, um, I think it was about a year ago, it came out, a TV station ran his full confession or parts of his confession. And it's pretty, it's just unnerving. Like he, the lights are on and nobody's home for like sure. Just matter of factly, right? Yeah. Like no and just, you know. Sympathy. Mm-hmm. But to know too about the psych hospital, knowing somebody obviously had to tell him that because as a 15 year old, 16, 17, 18, you're not going to know Well, that. I'm sure his lawyer told him that. He, what if he would have said, okay, I'll do those. And then they he, maybe he could have been fixed. I don't know. And then not all these charges. And maybe he could have been a productive citizen of society. I doubt it. But maybe. I don't know. Do you think if he's originally not showing any empathy? I mean, no, you can I fake just, it. You can I fake just, empathy, I just which it sounds underst- like he's been doing. Yeah. I just don't understand before. how people like this. I don't understand how people like this mm-hmm. exist. It's just weird to me. I mean, I... I saw a little nant on my kitchen counter and it was dead. And I was like, oh, poor thing. Mm-hmm. I can't, you know what I mean? I can't imagine people. Like, I just, I don't know. I don't understand how you could kill somebody and then, and that little girl and like break the knife off in their head. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, but you could just stop it, kill somebody. I mean, but then it, it's one thing and not getting into, you know, too many. It's one thing to kill somebody with a gun. It is another to stab them 58 times and then do it again and then again. And you don't even know these people. It's not like you're mad at them that they, you know, did something wrong to you. You just, i am that's just some unbridled rage. That is horrible. Well, not only rage, but he was on tripping on acid too, correct? Yeah, but Acid and weed. And if the little girl reached out and touched him and it was in the dark. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, he's going to f- that freak out. And then with all that rage. Yeah, because you know an eight-year-old versus a two hundred and what did I say two hundred? But when pound? you're on ap- acid, you're I not guess. gonna, you know, you're not in your right mind. Not that I'm giving any excuses for him. He's no, I know. But you know, just, and then to to have the knowledge to make it all the way home and then be like, oh man, I touched right. that skillet, mm-hmm. and then run all the way back and yeah, I don't know. Unreal, unreal. So that is the Craig Price. There's so much stuff out there about him. A lot of people have covered him, but like we have said before on our show, I never listen to podcasts that cover what we do because I don't want to, I don't want it to jade or get in, you know, in my head, in our mm-hmm. heads, right? You're the same way. We just don't right. because we don't want to. There's a few exceptions, mm-hmm. very few exceptions for me. I don't think I have at all. I mean, I'll watch like TV shows and stuff like that, but sometimes you really have to check the stats on that too because they don't know what they're talking about either. Oh, yeah. For my thing next week, I am listening to a podcast because it's pretty much one of the are you only... Just, are, you, are you writing it down verbatim and you're just going to just put your name on it? Mm-hmm. Well, it's just... Oh, wait. No, that's right. We just read from Wikipedia. I forgot about that. Oh, you're being So better. I wish this okay. 11 pages on Craig Price was just from Wikipedia. Just okay. saying. Wikipedia was like... So have you... Um... Three pages. Yeah, I'm bitter. Whatever. <laughs> Any TV shows that you... I know you have been. Are you kidding? What have I not watched? You ready? You want the mm-hmm. countdown? All right. There's a TV show called The Offer with Miles Teller. I stumbled upon that on my snow day. I was obsessed. So if you're a movie person like me, if you like that kind of stuff, it is the real story, but it's fictionally done, but it's all the real people of Al Ruddy, who was um, the producer of the movie The Godfather. Now, this kid, he was a young guy. And he worked as an IT guy, computer guy. And he was like, I want to make movies. So he like begged his way into Robert Evans' world. If you know Robert Evans, The Kid Stays in the Picture. Great documentary. You should check that out too. And he did that. So it's like a 10 episode. And it's funny because like, okay, we all know, no offense, actors and actresses are batshit crazy. They're crazy. And then the people, publicists, even crazier managers crazy they're all they're all like wackadoodle crazy so it's just kind of fun to watch all that miles teller is adorable and then it was fun to see like the guy that played al pacino and marlon brando and it was just fun it was so that was kind of a fun show so that's 10 episodes of that anything about the author maria puzo oh yeah he's in there with frank 
Francis Ford Coppola. It's it's I'm telling gotcha. you, it is it is awesome. You have to watch, and it was good. It was really good. It was really well done. Um, Miles Teller executive produced it along with Al Ruddy, um, who it's based on. But another a good thing is, um, so Robert Evans is a famous movie producer. He used to run Paramount Studios first. It's so he has a documentary. Well, he wrote a book called The Kid Stays in the Picture because he started out as an actor. Like, you can't make this stuff up. It's awesome. But so then if you pair my um, Al Ruddy's story <laughs> with Robert Evans, it's just kind of funny because, you know, people in Hollywood have egos, shall we say. So it's kind of different, but it kind of gives. I was so brilliant that I discovered this, right? And they're mm-hmm. both kind of say, I don't know. It's just funny. So that was good. Let's see. What about you? I, I'm going to look up some other stuff I watched. What else? Uh, you watch? I just started the Poker Face, the new TV show on mm-hmm. Peacock mm-hmm. with Natasha Leone or mm-hmm. Leone. I don't know how you mm-hmm. pronounce her name. I've always liked her. It's very enjoyable. That's really it. I haven't really watched anything, to oh. be honest. Okay, I did. Hold on here. Let me see. No, here. I know. I mean, you're pretty much that's, that's what I do. It's funny. on it. I watched Till. This morning, the story of Emmett Till. Oh, yeah, I can't do that. Boy, was that heartbreaking. Uh, watch The Menu. You watched that. I as watched well. The Menu. I've seen I, that. I thought that I was fun. I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. I thought it was fun. Um, you know, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but people griped about the ending, and the ending was nothing that I thought it was going to be. I was thinking it was going to be something different. So I I, I thought it was. I, I thought it I was thought a it fine was, ending. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. I mean,. Um, we already I talked remember. about the onion or the the knives out. Mm-hmm. I that finished one was good. 1883. I like that one. Did we talk about 1883 on here yet? Which is I'm the not for sure. Taylor Sheridan. I don't. First of all, that guy does not sleep, and I don't know. He's like Aaron Sorkin. I don't know how he does this. Like he has the mayor of Kingston, Kingstown. I always say Kingston because my sister lives in Kingston, Kingstown. Then he has 1883, 1923, and then Yellowstone. He has all those going at the same time. It's crazy. But anyway, 1883. If you I. <laughs> It ruined my day. I cried so hard for like two hours. Weird. I was like, I was not prepared for that. And I'm not really a crier. So that was like, it like ruined my day. I was like, I can't do anything else today. I am mourning. I am mourning the loss of that character. You know how you relate to that stuff. But anyway. Well, that was a spoiler a- alert. There's a loss of a character. So. Well, but yeah. it's yellow. It's the Yellowstone. There's a loss of a character every single episode. So there's that. Oh, The Godfather of Harlem, season three just came out. That's really good. I have a little crush on Forrest Whitaker. I have since I can't even tell you when. I like that guy so much. Um, so that's really good. And it is the true story in fictional, fictionalized you know, saga. Bumpy Johnson, who was a big drug dealer in Harlem, but he goes up against the mob and all those. So I like that kind of stuff. So yeah, that's... I need to get a life. After I spout this all off, I'm like, God, can we, <laughs> you, you are a loser. I'm not saying you don't, but yeah. It's winter. That's what I do. And I do it in the summer. You do, it, you do it all the time. It's either too hot to go outside or it's too, too cold it's too to cold. go outside. Yeah, it's too you rainy. just want to watch TV. It's, it's all good. It's all good. I, I like it. I do other stuff when I do it, you know, like my painting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. You're paid by numbers, which mm-hmm. is a good thing. Yeah. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. I'm not judging at no, all. I'm judging me. I'm judging me. I would judge me. No, I um really want to start The Last of Us on HBO. That's No, I've heard that's really good, but I haven't. I don't know. Uh, My husband played the video game and so it's based absolutely on video loved game? it. It's based on a video. Yep. Yeah. And he absolutely loved it. I mean, this is like the video. Uh, This is the game. PlayStation Four or five, I forget. Mm-hmm. But like he, he loved it. Like he, it's one that he talks about constantly. Like he'll talk hmm. about the other video games that he's played, but he always brings this one up. Aww. And so I think there's only three episodes, maybe four. But he mm-hmm. won't watch it because he wants to binge it. And so, yeah, yeah, that's so. Now I might just have to sneak and do it on my own. Well, there's something because I'm be interested s- in it. Yeah. Something to be said for that binging. It's just nice to go back to back to back. I don't know. Yellowstone has taken a break. And so they come out at the beginning of, Feb- beginning of February. But, and it's just like, it's why? Because now I can't even remember what happened. Mm-hmm. You know? And they, they just started breaking in January. So they broke for like four or five weeks or something. It was. It's like, what's that for? What are you doing? I People just need a vacation. No, they don't. They're already taped. You know, they're already taped. So just let me have it. It's like my drug. Just let me have it. Just let, let me have it. I just want, I gotta base. see what happens. Yeah. I don't know what happens. All right. Well, that's uh, it. We do have you... a promo this week. Our friends from Brew Crime, JT Wait. and Mike. 
Wait, are you going to tell the good folks that we're going to Poland? <laughs> if you want I to. A, I had a dream that Jennifer and I went to Poland for a podcast festival. I don't know why. And so now I just think that's funny and I keep talking about it. Okay, never mind. But catch Jen and I over in Poland sometime in the near future if they have one, if we go. That's all. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyway, our uh, friends, JT and Mike from Brew Crime, for, oh, fuck. Anyway, sorry, Nico, cut all that. Our promo that we have today at the end, since it's the end of the show, is from our friends JT and Mike from Brew Crime. They pair up with our friend Paige from Reverie, and they do a monthly current news segment called Brewery. And uh, you can find the episode drops on each of their feeds, on each of their podcast feeds. So make sure to listen. It's fun. It's kind of goofy. And um, you guys will probably like it. So make sure to listen to the promo and then check them out. Yay. Yay. Yeah. And we get to meet Mike in person here in August. And Paige. And Paige. we are going to the I True forgot. Crime Podcast yep. Festival in August in Austin, Texas. Please come see so, us. Come see us. It'll be fun. Let, There's let a- the streak continue. Every time we go to one of these, we have at least one or two people that come. And we just feel so warm and fuzzy and makes us happy. Mm-hmm. And come to Poland, too. Yes. And we will post a link of the <laughs> how you can get your... Jen's just ignoring me. She didn't even no, I she am. <laughs> no. And... Uh, yeah, we'll post a link to the True Crime Podcast Festival and how you can get your tickets and everything in the show notes of this episode. All right. Well, I think that's about it. If uh hope everybody has a nice rest of the week and life's treating you well. And until next time, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Cam. For more information about this episode, as well as all the sources I used, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at ourtruecrimepodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by hosts Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all Our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Bertese from We Talk of Dreams. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. Our True Crime Podcast is executive produced by Nico Vertese and Dick Bain. Make sure to like and subscribe to Our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. You can email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. If you really like the show, make sure to check out our Patreon at Our True Crime Podcast. Our True Crime Podcast is an OTC production. Brew Crime in association with Reverie True Crime present The Brewery Report, your daily news delivered to you monthly. Join Mike, Paige, and JT as they cover the stories you won't hear on the major news channels. Why, you ask? Well, because they're just that stupid. (coughs) Covering animals, crimes, travel, celebrity, politics, and more. We do the research so you don't have to. I wish they would have included a disclaimer not to drink anything, because I almost spit out my chai tea latte with four pumps of vanilla. (laughs) <laughs> we know, we know. We're working on it. You can find us anywhere you listen to Brew Crime or Reverie True Crime. So make sure you behave or fuck around and find out. And you might find yourself on next month's Brewery Report. <laughs>